I'd like to begin by saying hello. <laughs> to the ladies in the audience, I may not know most of you, but I do know something about all of you. And uh, this is what I know. You're a fighter. Nope, I'm not clairvoyant, but I know how to read. And the statistics tell our stories. Despite being half of the workforce, women only represent 4% of CEOs. One third of all businesses are women owned, but less than 10% of venture capital funding goes to women entrepreneurs. And more than half of us are the voting electorate, but only 19% of us are in Congress. You know these statistics too. That's why you're here today. You came looking for answers on how to beat the odds to succeed in spite of these statistics. That's what fighters do. So today, I'm here to talk to the fighters about grit and grace. One won't let you give up, but the other makes it okay to let go. And we need both in life to succeed, especially as women facing incredible odds. So grit is your fight. It's your passion, determination, moxie. It's your hustle. It's the diva in you that helps you to show up for a fight especially when you want to give up. We've all been there. I'm what some describe as a double outsider. I'm a woman, and I'm black. In my career, I've worked hard to earn positions where I've been the first and the only person that looks like me, which, of course, means I've done a whole lot of fighting. At 33, when I was vice president of communications at NPR, National Public Radio, I uh, was the first African American in that role. This is where I first learned how to speak up and speak the truth to power when I asked why someone, a man, less experienced than me was being given an opportunity over me. And then, I, when I became the first woman and the first African-American to lead communications for an Illinois governor, a reporter on the day that I was appointed asked me this question. Did you get this job because black people voted for the governor and they came out in big numbers and he owes them? It was a headline for a story about me. And then the Chicago Urban League. I was the first woman and CEO in the history of the Chicago Urban League, an iconic civil rights organization, the first in their 93-year history. In 2010, I ran for US Senate, a seat uh, vacated by President Barack Obama. I was the only woman and the only African American in the race. The question that I got over and over again that stunned me the most was, who are you to run for US Senate? You've never held elected office. This was true, I never held elected office. But neither had two of the three candidates who were men, yet they would never ask that question. The truth is, trailblazing is hard. You have to be wired a certain way, wired to take more blows than you're able to give and still find a way to stand strong and succeed in the face of enormous adversity. Women face battles every day and everywhere, at work, at school, in government, as entrepreneurs in our businesses, and even at home. But thankfully, there's a lot of advice out there on how to use your voice 
have a seat at the table, stand up, lean in. I know, I bought all the books. <laughs> Register for every conference. <laughs> I have spent uh, a lot of my career fighting, fighting for justice, equality, and fighting for opportunities for others. So you know, I know how to fight. I knew how to fight. That is, until cancer and divorce showed up at my door, hand in hand. In February of 2013, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. I was, had a routine doctor's appointment, a uh, routine annual physical doctor's appointment, and um, he looked at me, he said, CJ, I need for you to go and see a breast surgeon immediately. Now this was after six months of me going to the doctors, several doctors, several physicians, healthcare providers, and having screenings, ultrasounds and mammogram, mammograms over a, a lump I thought I detected. Everyone said, there is nothing. Tests came back, there is nothing. So now my doctor tells me to go and see a breast surgeon. Well, the breast surgeon told me, in fact, I had breast cancer. You know, I didn't hear any words beyond those first two words, it's cancer. I was stunned. I sat there paralyzed in that moment, wondering how could this be? And then my next thought was, I haven't yet reached my full potential. And that was really sad to me. But then I went into beast mode. <laughs> I became the CEO of my care team and I took control. I immediately had a radical left mastectomy to remove the cancer and to remove my entire breast. About uh, several months later, followed up and I had the biggest of three surgeries and it was to reconstruct my breast from tissue and muscle from my back. It was a very painful, the most painful of the three surgeries. I left the hospital with tubes coming out of me, bandages from my chest to my stomach and wrapped around my back in an enormous amount of pain and even unable to walk. But what would come next was unimaginable. It changed me in ways that I never expected. I got home that day and 17 year marriage to my best friend, a man I'd known for more than 24 years, unraveled in one dramatic, surreal, and manic moment. You know, every marriage uh, no marriage is perfect. Every marriage has problems, and mine was no different. But I didn't see this coming, not like that, and certainly not in that moment. Distressed, I left. I checked into a hotel to recuperate, and I laid in bed for a week, unable to sleep, didn't talk, didn't eat. I was in so much pain, physical pain, emotional pain, spiritual pain. I was broken. So what happens when you're facing the battle of your life, but you have no more fight left in you? What do you do then? That's where grace steps in. What I learned while healing from, great, from heal, healing from cancer and going through a very bitter divorce is this. Grace is a superpower. It can sustain you, strengthen you, and transform you. You all probably may be thinking about grace in the way that the songwriter 
who wrote Amazing Grace, you know, in the biblical sense, you're thinking about it in the biblical sense. You know, I do believe that grace is a gift from God. And I like the way theologians define grace as God's love in action toward man. Today, I want to talk about grace as love in action toward self. It has enormous, enormous power. But only if you unleash the power of grace. And to unleash the power of grace, you have to first activate it. So whether you're in a big and dark moment that brings you to your knees, or you're just dealing with the day-to-day -day drama that wears on your nerves little by little, what you need to do to activate grace, you have to practice three things. Here they are. First, self-compassion. Next, self-care. And finally, self-acceptance. Now, for the fighters, that's difficult to do because it feels like inaction. It's the opposite of fighting. The grit in you says to stand up, lean in, and power through. But grace says, sit down, lean back, and plug into the power within. That's uncomfortable for fighters. But here's why I need for you to step outside your comfort zone and try. Practicing grace prepares you for future and bigger battles and positions you for success that you can sustain. I, um, I gained 35 pounds um, as a result of cancer treatments. I went from a size six to a 12. So you know mama was freaking out. <laughs> I was um, completely obsessed with trying to lose weight. But Grace taught me how to choose rest and sleep over six days in the gym and 5 a.m. runs. Before my life crisis, I said yes to everybody and everything, and I was everywhere. <laughs> but Grace taught me that sometimes your world has to go small before it can go big again. For a year, the only people in my world was my mother, my sister, and my best friend. These were the people that were OK with our relationship being one way for a while. A year after my diagnosis, I relented and agreed to co-chair a breast cancer awareness fundraiser. Well, I failed at it. I wasn't ready. I wasn't physically or emotionally ready to take that on. I let them down, and I let myself down. A lot of shame came from that. But Grace taught me that you really do need to put the oxygen mask on yourself first before you can help someone else, no matter how great that cause is or how badly you want to do it. This difficult time in my life was a gift. It put me on the path to learning how to practice grace with myself. I'm still struggling with it. But here's what I find or found and still find amazing about grace. First, it's incredibly accessible. It's like taking your next breath. It is always there and in abundant supply. Second, it can take your darkest moment and turn it into a priceless gift. Third, 
When you practice grace with yourself, you more easily extend it to others. And I haven't met a person that doesn't need grace. And then last, the more grace you practice, the more power you gain. So, this is the call to action for all the fighters here today in the room. I need for you to decide today to activate that secret superpower, grace. Give some thought to what self-compassion and self-care and self-expression, what it looks like for you in your life at work, at school, as entrepreneurs, artists, activists, as women who are working hard to beat the odds to succeed. Think about creating grace moments for yourself. You know, you can find an hour of grace on the sofa when you choose to take a nap over punching out that errand list on the one day that you have off. <laughs> There's a lot of grace in the word no. There's a little grace in the shoe department at Neiman's. <laughs> I'm just saying, putting that out there. And for me, the trailblazer, I don't know, maybe grace means hopping off that trail for a while and choosing opportunities that nurture and feed my soul. So ladies, while you're out there slaying dragons, <laughs> saving the world, fighting for everybody, don't forget to activate your superpower, grace. May the grit of your fight always be met by the power of God's grace towards you. Thank you. Thank you.